<coughs> this, folks, is the world's first full frame, four axis, fully stabilized cinema camera. And it's pretty nuts. So DJI just launched their first cinema camera, the Ronin 4D, and they've taken a big step to entering a new market and arguably even creating a new market by basically combining the camera and the gimbal all into one hybrid product. It's unique, it's creative, it's fun, but is it for you? Let's find out. So DJI sent me a beta version to test out and to review, and after several weeks of using the camera, I'm now gonna be giving you my thoughts on what I like, what I don't like, its strengths, its weaknesses, and who I think Think this camera is made for and hopefully by the end help you decide if it's worth buying or not. So let's start off with the camera portion and then work our way to the gimbal system. Now specs wise this is a full frame censored camera that can shoot 6k raw at up to 48 frames per second and it also has a super 35 crop sensor mode that can shoot at 4k at up to 96 frames per second and 2k at up to 120 frames per second and you can squeeze out a few more frames from each of those resolutions if you use the wide aspect ratio mode. As far as color bit depth, this will give you 16 bit raw and 10 bit at 422HQ and H264. So when you're shooting in D-Log or raw, this allows for very nice color gradability and has been one of the better grading experiences that I've had with any camera. If any of you have shot with the DJI Mavic 2 Pro 10 bit 4K image, then you're familiar with DJI's D-Log footage and how well it grades. But the Ronin 4D, having a much larger full frame sensor and even more dynamic range, takes this image quality and post flexibility to a whole new level. And speaking of dynamic range, this comes in at 14 plus stops of dynamic range. Now I didn't do any scientific tests, but just based off of my experience shooting with it in mixed lighting environments, again, this is one of the better cameras I've used at handling highlights and shadows, definitely cinema camera level and a big step up from most DSLR and mirrorless cameras. As for low light performance, it's decent with a dual ISO at 800 and 5000. I wasn't blown away with the low light performance, but it's usable at higher ISOs. The overall image quality, however, is superb. And probably the thing that Lana and I were both most impressed with about this camera. I believe the image quality rivals that of any cinema camera I've used. And most cinema cameras have a super 35 crop, and this is actually full frame, which you usually have to pay a premium price for. And though the pricing hasn't been announced for this yet, it is going to be far less than most full frame cinema cameras out on the market. And another one of my favorite features about this camera are the codecs. You can choose between shooting ProRes RAW, ProRes 422HQ, and H.264. Both ProRes options are going to give you huge file sizes, but the ProRes codec is just a dream to edit. It's so smooth and so easy to use. A lot of good codec and resolution options depending on what your needs are, if you want something higher quality and easier to edit, or something more compressed that takes up less space. Another nice thing about this camera is that you can either choose to use their DJI Pro SSD, or you can interchange with a CF Express card, the same one that my Canon R5 takes, so it's nice that it gives you multiple storage options. And you can also record externally, but of these three options, you can only record RAW through the DJI Pro SSD. As far as battery life goes, it's surprisingly good. This is an area that most cinema cameras struggle in, and especially since the battery is powering the camera, the gimbal, and the monitor, you'd think it wouldn't be great, but the battery lasts about two hours and 10 minutes according to my tests, which I think is awesome, especially since it only takes 50 minutes to charge a battery, so I can swap between two as long as one's charging and never run out all day. And this camera also takes the same TB batteries as the Inspire 2 and Ronin 2, so if you own either of those DJI products, it's nice that you can share batteries with those systems. And the monitor that comes with it, again, is surprisingly good. Most monitors that come with cinema cameras aren't great, and this is one of the better included monitors that I've used. It is pretty bright, but if the sun is glaring directly on it, it will still be tough to see, but overall very easy to use in most situations. I like the size at 5.5 inches, not too small, not too bulky. It is a full touchscreen, and the menu system is super intuitive and straightforward. It has a similar feel to the DJI drone menu system, but I'd say this one is even more intuitive and even easier to learn. And in general, that's one of the highlights of this camera is that again, relative to most cinema cameras that I own, this is super easy to learn and figure out how to use out of the box. Some of my other favorite features of this camera as far as ease of use goes is the dual handle system that can quickly adjust to multiple positions. I can tell DJI really thought through the design of this camera. And even though it's their first 
Universe Cinema Camera, I feel like design-wise, they already have done a lot of things better than their competitors who have been at this for decades. First off, these handles can easily slide on and off, lock into position for breakdown for travel or for making the overall footprint smaller when needed, but the ergonomics of the handles are spot on, super comfortable with buttons for recording, turning on and off focus peaking, switching between different settings on your screen, turning autofocus tracking on and off, turning exposure tools on and off, and then on top of the handles, you have a joystick to control the gimbal and knobs for racking focus or changing any of the camera settings by pushing the mode button to switch between different settings. Truly, the user experience of this camera is one of the best I've ever experienced. As far as buttons on the camera body itself, you have the on and off button, which one of the drawbacks I immediately noticed was the startup time being around 15 to 18 seconds, but they say this will be optimized in future hardware updates. That slow startup time is more in line with slower cinema cameras, so if you're shooting run and gun dock documentary style filming, you kind of have to choose between wasting battery life and potentially missing a moment because you turn it off to save battery. And if a moment is happening, by the time the camera boots up, it's already over. But again, this is pretty standard for cinema cameras. My RED, for example, boots up in about twice the time at around 30 seconds. So just something to be aware of there. You also have the Z axis button here that turns on and off the fourth axis, which we'll get to shortly. Other customizable buttons here. Then you have switches for your different gimbal settings like you would have on a Ronin. You have a mic jack, a headphone jack, an HD my port, a DC in port, and then on the back you have your slot for the TB batteries. Then on the top handle, another M button for quick sports mode activation, a toggle that I'm guessing is for future zoom lens capabilities, and then hot shoe mounts for monitors or microphones or whatever else you need. Another great feature is that yes, this camera does have ND filters, and it goes from ND2 all the way up to ND512, which is equivalent to about nine stops. Also, this camera does have autofocus. It is a LiDAR autofocus system that works with DJI eye lenses and specific other third-party lenses, and it comes with three different focusing modes, wide, spot, and smart. Smart is probably the most reliable of the three modes as it allows you to pick what you want in focus and it will actively track that object as it moves around. And after trying it out in a bunch of scenarios, there were times that it performed well and other times that it wasn't super reliable. For example, Lannon found that the active track worked well when he was filming the bikers, kept them in focus super well. I'm using it right now to shoot this talking head. And as you can see, it keeps my face in focus nicely as I move around. So overall, pretty impressive auto focusing system for a cinema camera. However, it's not full fully reliable in all situations. Here's a couple of scenarios where I found it struggling. When the subject is over 10 meters away, it tends to hunt because that exceeds the measuring range of the LiDAR rangefinder. Also, when there's a lot of obstructing objects in the foreground, sometimes it gets confused and hunts around looking for a main subject. And sometimes the smart mode isn't quite as smart as you want and can focus on random objects in the foreground like clothes or other body parts besides the face. So it definitely has a lot of room for improvement, but again, as their first edition of this autofocusing system, System, it's pretty dang good. Now, as for the manual focusing system on this camera, again, it is the best I've used. I've never actually experienced a manual focusing system quite as good as this one. Like I mentioned, the focus wheel is in the perfect position at the tip of your thumb and pointer finger. And when using DJI lenses, it electronically communicates, giving you a buttery smooth rack focus and shows you on the side of your monitor how many feet away your focus is set. Then combine that with focus peaking, and this focusing system is extremely intuitive. It also has a LiDAR waveform focus tool as well. However, I do prefer using the focus peaking. But whereas most electronic manual focus systems are laggy, glitchy, or unreliable, this one responds immediately, perfectly smooth, and basically allows you to pull focus as a one-man crew. And in the case that you don't want to pull your own focus, they have a remote focusing system as well, so you can transmit your camera signal to an external 7-inch monitor and have a crew member pull focus for you. Overall, the remote focusing system is really good, very minimal lag. The controls for aperture and focus are really nice and intuitive, plus there are quite a few other camera controls on the remote, and it has slots for the same side handles that you use on the actual camera that will allow you to enable a mode called mirror control mode that allows the remote monitor to have the same interface as the main monitor, so you will have full control of the camera. So awesome remote system option as well. So that's basically the features of the camera portion of this product, but like I mentioned, it is basically a camera and stabilizer built into one. So let's now talk about the gimbal system. For those familiar with DJI's gimbals like the RS2, everything looks pretty familiar up here with the three axes that you're used to seeing and also has the Active Track Pro for selecting a subject so that the gimbal can track subjects for you. Also, just like the RS2, each of the axes can lock and unlock just
just like the RS2 and have knobs for balancing, etc. But what's different from the RS2 and from most gimbals is that there is a fourth axis. It's basically a chicken head that has sensors pointing towards the ground and moves up and down to counteract the notorious up and down movements you get when walking or running. Three axis gimbals are awesome at stabilizing pan and tilt and rotation, but because we slightly move up and down when we walk and make impactful bouncing footsteps when we run, those movements can show up with a three axis gimbal. And so this fourth axis gimbal looks to eliminate that so that the shot in theory will look perfectly smooth. So how well does it work? As far as I can tell, it does its job exactly as it's supposed to, at least most of the time. There are scenarios, however, where I actually felt like it was doing more damage than good. For example, I took it out on a boating trip and a speedboat will rock back and forth and fluctuate elevation by about a foot or two as it rocks. And in this scenario, if I'm sitting next to someone filming a tight shot of their face, we're both on the boat and both rocking together, so I don't need that fourth access to help. But it's sensing the boat's movements and shooting up and down trying to counter the boat's movements, which makes my subject shoot in and out of frame. So it's important to know that the fourth access isn't intended to always be on. You only use it when you need it. And I found myself actually turning it off more than I turned it on. The three access system is already great and gonna get you by in most scenarios. It's also very new. And so I'm sure with newer firmware updates, they will solve some of these issues. So this might just need time and practice to master, but there's obviously times where it does come in handy. Like if you're running full speed and tracking a subject or going upstairs or walking on uneven ground, in which case this is gonna be very helpful helpful. So there's definitely times where it does shine. However, I personally found myself leaving the chicken in the cage most of the time, which is nice that they give you that option to turn it on and off. But that brings me now to the biggest weakness of the camera, which is actually one of its strengths at the same time, just depends on the scenarios you need it for. And that is that the camera and the gimbal are inseparable. We're used to being able to take the camera off of the gimbal, put it on sticks, use it handheld, but you can't do that with this. The sensor is detached from the rest of the camera and attached onto the gimbal. So it doesn't really work like any other cinema camera, but is meant to only be used for smooth moving gimbal shots. And that was one of the first questions I asked DJI was, well, can I just lock it in place and use it handheld or for a tripod like this? And they said, yes, you can, but there is a little bit of give. It's not perfectly set. And so for a tripod like this, it's fine. But if I were doing any kind of movement on the tripod or if I was doing any kind of handheld movements, there would be a little bit of give in that locking position. So it's not actually meant to be used used in the locking position. What they recommended me do if I wanted to use a handheld type shot was to hold down the M button and use sports mode. And admittedly, that did give me a pretty close replication to a handheld look, but you are having to hold down a button the whole time while you're filming in handheld. So just a drawback to be aware of, and probably the biggest drawback to consider with this camera compared to other cinema cameras is that you're always going to be tied to a gimbal. But that's also its strength, is that instead of having a huge stick with a lollipop or those big bulky cages, it's all built into this small compact system. So I guess it really just comes down to how much you shoot with gimbals. If you're always using a gimbal, then you're gonna love that it's all built in. But if you shoot a good mix of sticks and handheld, then this will probably be a little bit frustrating for you or just a specialty camera that you only pull out for those smooth gimbal scenarios. Landon, who shoots a good mix of handheld and gimbal, said he actually didn't mind shooting the handheld with this at all, that yes, it was annoying to have to hold down the M button, but that should be resolved in a future firmware update to be able to just double tap the M button and it will stay in sports mode. So again, that drawback could be fixed in future firmware updates. But let's talk about another strength of this camera, and that is the size and the weight. For context, this is about the same footprint as my red weapon and weighs in at about the same at a little over 10 pounds. So when I say light and small, it is the same size and weight as my red setup, but the red isn't attached to any gimbal system yet. Once I do that, it's about three times the size and about double the weight. So no, the Ronin 4D isn't necessarily super light or super small, but compared to most cinema cameras, once they're all rigged up on a stabilizer, by that time it's often too big to carry on its own, so you have to put on a big old vest, and now you're looking at a 50 pound plus setup and a shirt drenched in sweat. So I definitely see the problem that DJI was trying to solve with this camera. And something Landon liked about it when he was carrying it around on a shoot was that it was a lot easier to manage than a typical RS2 and DSLR setup, where you have to put it into underslung mode or turn off the motors if you ever wanna hold it at your side, whereas the Ronin 4D is compact enough 
that you can bring it up to shoot and then let it rest at your side without any extra steps in between. So for a gimbal plus cinema camera setup, this is a tough setup to beat as far as compactness, lightweight, and ease of use go. But let's now talk about my second biggest drawback to be aware of in this hybrid system, and that is the lens options. The Ronin 4D seems to have been built specifically for DJI lenses or similarly small lenses. It is amazing that it's a full frame sensor, but because the gimbal itself isn't very big, it is limited in the carrying capacity and its position adjustments. It should be able to carry most prime lenses under 800 grams and under 100 millimeter focal length, but heavier lenses, cinema lenses, zoom lenses are mostly out of the question. So I was sad to learn that I couldn't use any of my go-to lenses, and I'm sure this will be a big point of concern for many professionals who want to use specific lenses. And it's not necessarily a problem of mounting, they are working on a long list of lens adapting compatibilities with E-mount, M-mount, and likely PL-mount. But again, the problem is that a lot of the lenses are too heavy for the gimbal, so I found myself just using the DJI lenses since they also work really well with the manual focusing system, and that's one of the greatest perks of using this camera. But as far as I know, there's only a 24 millimeter, 35 millimeter, and 50 millimeter available in the DJI lens lineup, and they're all 2.8 aperture and not a 1.4 like most prime lenses, and I'm sure they'll develop more in the future, but for now, that's the lineup, so it is kind of limiting. So I'd say as long as you can live with your camera and gimbal always being married, and you can live with the limited lens options, then this is an unrivaled system that's going to be exciting for a lot of professionals. For those who need more versatility in lens options and find them shooting a lot more handheld, then purchasing the Ronin 4D is going to be more of a secondary specialty camera, similar to how you would buy a drone. And for that purpose, as a specialty camera, there are a few camera and gimbal systems that are going to rival it. And now the big question, how much does it cost? Well, pricing hasn't been announced, unfortunately, yet, so I can't give you that information. However, I've been told that it will be reasonably priced and affordable for small production companies. I think it's safe to say that it will be under $10,000 for the full setup. So it won't be cheap, but it's definitely more affordable than most cinema camera plus gimbal setups. So it's not for everyone. For me personally, this isn't replacing any of my cameras, but it is a specialty tool that I can see myself using in certain situations, like on the back of jet skis or in helicopters or run and gun situations where I want the gimbal movement without the cumbersome heavy rig. And so for that purpose, I do think this system is worth buying for professionals looking to add that to their arsenal. And I believe this product is going to fill that void in the marketplace, similar to how drones fill the aerial shot void in the marketplace. So there you have my initial thoughts on the all new Ronin 4D. Regardless though of whether it's for you or not, it is still exciting to see DJI innovating and creating new creative products that help cinematographers shoot footage that they previously could couldn't in much easier, more affordable, and more efficient ways. So big thanks to DJI for sending me this camera and allowing me to review it. We'll leave a link in the description if you'd like to check it out and learn more about it. Also, we have a separate video showing Landon doing a full project shot on this camera and a behind the scenes of using the camera, and you can click over here to check that out. Lastly, don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this, and if you have any further questions, please let me know. So there's times where it shines and makes a big difference and other times where you just leave the kitchen in the, where you just leave the kitchen, the chicken, my gosh. Most of the time I found myself leaving the kitchen, holy crap, chicken. But I did find myself leaving the chicken, <laughs> find myself leaving the kitchen, chicken, oh my gosh. But I did find myself leaving the chicken kitchen. I can't do this. But I did personally find myself leaving the kitchen. Chicken. <laughs> Why can't I say it? But I personally found myself leaving the kitchen. <laughs> chicken, 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 chicken. Personally leaving the kitchen. So there's definitely, so there's, <laughs> I personally found myself leaving the chicken in the cage most of the time. Wow.